You know, we're not Italian Americans. We're not uh, Irish Americans. We're not Korean Americans. We're not Black Americans. We're not Japanese Americans. We're not we're not Latin Americans. We are Americans. And just that idea that America is not a race. It's a set of values and principles that you abide by that creates this um, social cohesion. And this is what I believe America should really be about. With awards from George Washington University, the Korean Arts Association, the Concordian Gallery of Art, and most recently, the inaugural title of Artist of the Year by Eileen Kaminsky Family Foundation. Arthur Kwan Lee is an American painter whose gestural mark-making expressive color palettes with world mythologies. Lee draws inspiration from a broad range of sources, including Jungian psychoanalysis, local religious traditions, and his lifelong commitment to martial arts. Prior to developing a love for painting, Lee was a Division I athlete who placed in the Taekwondo Nationals for three consecutive years. Lee has carried this martial arts intensity into his artwork, where it translated into large-scale works and a diversity of dynamic brushstrokes. The resulting compositions attest to an artist who uses his entire body to paint symbolic works that contain oblique references to archetypal myths from around the world. Lastly, Arthur Kwan Lee has most recently appeared on the Jesse Lee Peterson Show, and today he joins me on The Bald Brad Show. All right, Arthur Kwan Lee, thank you so much for joining the Bald Brad Show. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Brad. How's the weather over there in New York? It's, it's very doomy and um, it's very gloomy. So, so <laughs> I do. Uh, the, the, the sun's not out, so it's, I, the, the lighting is a little bit weird here, but it's all good. I got to ask, so I'm over here in Southern California and you're over there in New York. And how has the pandemic been treating you all the way over there across the country? You know, uh, I go to Cali pretty often, actually, and and what they both have in common is it's just it's, it's we're shut down, you know. But um, things are things are starting to come pick back up. So, um, I know that for my industry, the galleries, the openings, the you know the openings for actually attending uh, the physical spaces have, have just started this Thursday. So that's that's a good sign. But um, mm. you know, we'll see. I, I'm 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 pretty, you know, I don't I don't do, it. I mean I'm trying to limit my wearing masks and caring about any of that. And I was just pretty much go on anyways with my own life and, and, you know, offend people. So it's okay. <laughs> now, as far as like, cause you're, you're, you're an artist and you're a painter and to kind of correlate that to the pandemic, has that, has that influenced you in any way? Because I'm an introvert. So this pandemic being locked down hasn't bothered me at all from going out, but as a, as a painter, do you get your inspiration from going out or are you totally comfortable with just working inside, not having to go out? You know, most, a lot of painters, they, they need to, uh, they, they like to get inspiration from other artists. And, and, and I think that applies, of course, to it in regards to the for, formalistic side of things. But I think I'm much more contextually driven. So if I read something that's stimulating or I start diving down some sort of symbolic excavation that I feel like resonates with our culture or something that's underemphasized, I want to overemphasize, you know, so especially with masculine imagery, like these different angles that um, I'm more um, philosophically oriented in a way. And I'm almost exploring these ideas in the realm of painting. So um, I, I mean, I, I like, it's always nice to see other artists and, and there will be those pieces that really hit me, but I definitely produce from a uh, sort of philosophical impulse. Now, I, I find it interesting because doing research about you, you have clearly a knack for Taekwondo. But when I think of a painter or an artist, I don't think of somebody that was doing, I don't, I don't know if you'd call it a mixed martial art, but doing uh, Taekwondo for, I would imagine, majority of your life because being a D1, uh, going to nationals, I think three times. Yeah, um, I got bronze. Um, I kept losing to my brother or that one <laughs> really tall kid who didn't lose my <laughs> kid, bye. <laughs> well, how, can you kind of take us through your, your early childhood and then how you got into Taekwondo and then how that ultimately morphed into being an artist? Sure. You know, um, my, I grew up in a pretty typical Korean American background, although my, uh, my, my parents, they were the, uh, um, when they immigrated here legally, they made it really clear that they wanted to put, you know, have us participate in the um, traditional cultures of playing an instrument, 
having some kind of martial art and then being being good at you know school getting being good at your academics but i was strange because i was terrible at school i did not play instruments well so i was like i better be doing something well so i i went i went really hard with the fighting and i really excelled at that actually but um during that time i was still painting and you know like most artists we we dive into this as a form of self-expression um and, and it was really a form of channeling but uh, I, I think what took it further was I started to apply those martial art principles into my painting practice. Mm. And I think that's really what caused me to be sort of uncommon amongst the uncommon because artists are already sort of uh, strange people. But <laughs> uh, so I, I always felt like I was a contrast in that regard. And, you know, especially now that's doubled with my, uh, I guess, political predilections. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I, I find it interesting because, so my father was a black belt in Shotokan and yeah. um, I oh. never did karate. I never did Brazilian jujitsu, although I wanted to, but I played ice hockey for 25 years. And I think, I think for our, our youth, it is very important for them to get into some sort of athletics because it's for me, the building blocks and the foundation of a youth. And it kind of builds a certain self within them. That's kind of, extrapolating into our culture and so doing research about taekwondo it, and correct me if i'm wrong but there was five core tenets of taekwondo courtesy integrity perseverance self-control and an indomitable spirit is that right that, that puts that that's a throwback for me i've been so <laughs> out of the loop man <laughs> again I was, I was a junior national uh competitor um mm. but yeah yeah that, that is that is true and you know it's uh what you're saying is definitely applicable in regards to I, I, I definitely would recommend any, especially boys in their, in their uh, teenage, you know, during that richly defined stage, you know, tapping into martial arts is a great outlet because you get to be aggressive, you get to fight, you get to, uh, but, but you're learning that all under a certain parameter. You know, there's a sensei there and senses are are selected by the way you can't just be a, a world champion and suddenly start teaching you need to be approved by a board so, uh, especially with the more um hands-on martial arts and what they're looking for is character you know so you can instill value so that um you understand the idea that if a true martial artist has power but does not abuse it and that's important because that's why i noticed that martial artists who really excel they tend to be conservative because they understand that if you're going to have power, you need to also have responsibility. But when you give power to a person who doesn't have that struggle and that dissonance that's necessary to appreciate that, that perspective, they just want more. And, and they don't have the, uh, um, they don't carry themselves with those challenges. But in martial arts, you're literally physically getting back up over and over again. So <laughs> it builds a certain character. So I, I, martial arts is something I would recommend actually heavily, you know, um, and you can apply it to other things. And I couldn't agree more. And, and, if you hear that weird little growling, I'm sorry. That's my, that's my puppy. Um. <laughs> I, and you know, what's funny is I saw, I saw the puppy on, on Instagram and it's absolutely okay. adorable. And I think oh, she, she, she's, a, she's a little bit of, a little bit of vain, you know, like she'll post for cameras and things. So if you hear little <laughs> growling, it's because she wants me to look at her, but I'm looking at the bald man. <laughs> <laughs> my, you know, it, it's so funny. Cause I actually grew up, we always had dogs growing up and I think, um, something my father always taught me was you could tell a lot by a dog lover or somebody that's a lover of animals. Right. And, and <laughs> yeah, the, the viewers are only going to love it. And, and so something I thought was so interesting was you brought up self-control and then responsibility and then overcoming things. And I think you see that all the way in sports of persevering and then overcoming, which in, in my mind would be attributed to the indomitable spirit of never letting go, you fall back, you fall down, you get back up and you keep going. And something that I've kind of observed through today's culture, through other people's milieus is that idea of like, once I fall, well, I don't know if I want to get back up. Maybe it's just easier to give up and move on to another mm -hmm. thing. And, or maybe it's attributed to some sort of instant gratification, but that's why I think sports and, or like Taekwondo and mixed martial arts is so. Well, well, well you know, you know, from the martial art that I love, I'm sorry, Sean, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, you're good. Oh, well, 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 the martial art that I love now is uh, judo. And in judo, they say fall down, uh, fall down six times, get up seven, right? Mm. Or uh, was it seven or eight? But, but the idea comes from that, um, you know, resilience and this notion that a setback is a setup for a comeback. You learn that in martial arts and a lot of sports for sure. But for me, um, 
you know, and, and this is something I like about your show too, is you're talking about the ideas too. And, and, and the deeper part of human nature, it's, I think we like to believe that we're just, uh, you know, conscious decision makers, you know, that, that, that function cerebrally the whole time, but we're a lot more circumstantial than we, than, than is to believe. And, um, for example, if a person gets a, a lot more physically in shape and they get a lot more upper body strength, um, this is a study done by the Telegraph in the United Kingdom, they're more likely to be conservative. Mm. Just because, so there's, there's certain biological imperatives that push a person's political disposition. And um, it's, it's something that um, actually Jordan Peterson talks about too. In fact, a lot of this stuff is circumstantial where our, our ideas actually have us we don't have our own ideas. And this is why I'm, I'm big on trying to support people at the nuclear level, get in shape, you know, eat healthier. Although I, I've been eating really bad lately, but, but you know what I mean? The general audience, like, like have, have that down to a routine, at least to a point and martial arts or a sport will definitely ground you to a degree with all that. I like you know? that idea of, and, and I want to definitely get into this later, the idea of, of your readings, because just hearing you talk in your other interviews, the way you carry yourself definitely shows your training in Taekwondo, but also mm -hmm. I could see that your readings not only influence you on an uh, individual level, but also through your art. So I definitely want to get into that in a moment, but I want to backtrack a little bit because your parent, you said your parents were immigrants and my father was an immigrant from England as well, came over legally. And I like that you added in there because I always throw that in there as well, legally. <laughs> There's a massive issue clearly going on at the border and I've covered this a lot, but what do your, what do, not only do you think, but what do your parents think about what is happening with this illegal immigration crisis at the U.S.-Mexico border? So, so that generation, right? I mean, first of all, mm, it supports a critical distinction that immigrants who came to this country at that generation is, is not the same as, as American baby boomers during that time, right? But they came during that time because baby boomers are regarded as the most narcissistic generation ever because they're the ones who created postmodern theory, feminism, uh, this, this uh, social justice phenomenon. Like it all comes from um, uh, the economic opportunity to just just be vain and narcissistic essentially because all this, because you, know, you can judge a generation by how you sort of pass down for the next generation essentially. Mm -hmm. And what they did is, anyways, I'm going on to a different rant, but, but my parents came here and um, my parents came here for the same reason many Koreans come here to become Americans, mm. you know, e pluribus, you know, out of many one. And that sentiment is something that we are forgetting. I often believe, and I, I'm going to sound like a hypocrite here because if you Google me, it's going to say, I, uh, my person who wrote my website says Korean American artist. It should just be American <laughs> artist. Because if you take, I, I really think people should take that out. You know, we're not Italian Americans. We're not. Uh, Irish Americans, we're not Korean Americans, we're not Black Americans, we're not Japanese Americans, we're not, we're not Latin Americans, we are Americans. And just that idea that America is not a race, it's a set of values and principles that you abide by that creates this um, social cohesion. And this is what I believe America should really be about. And, but my, that's why my parents, they, they came here to live that. They came here to actually... Um, take action based on those principles and beliefs. So they're actually not that uh, conscientious of these theories or policy or any of that. They're here living uh, the experience of being American. You know, they're, they're old school people, you know. Uh, but I will say though that they're now starting to become more aware of it though, because my father, when he came to this country, um, he said that, I guess technically I was really more of like a libertarian, but without changing a single point, on any issue in 40 years, he's now looked at upon as like this right wing person mm. amongst his peers because the social fabric has changed so much. So I think now with that context, it's sort of, it's sort of revealing how things have unfolded and how the left wants to, you know, divide and conquer and create everyone into these tribes and tell women that this is the narrative that caused you to, you should be feeling this men should be feeling instead of out of anyone. It's different tribes that have to go against, castigate against one another. So I think that's um, the fault here. But many Koreans of that time, they came here to become essentially conservatives. Like they came there, they, it, when they were in Korea, they understood that if we're going to come to this country, 
we're going to be conservatives, which is why so many of them love guns. <laughs> 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 and, 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 and I, I, and we'll, we'll get into that too, because and it's so funny because talking to you, there's, there's so many crossovers between what we're talking about, not just with the social fabric and not just with the individual. And then also talking about the collective, but that all extrapolates through your artwork. So it's almost, it's almost hard to kind of talk in such a, a point to point conversation because everything within what I see from you really interwoves everything about you. And so it's almost difficult because I see your aspect of Taekwondo in your art. I see the aspect of the Korean culture in your art. I see the aspect of the mythology in your art or looking at other cultures, Western culture, the second amendment, all these things are woven into your art. And I'm not an art person. And I, and I believe Jesse Lee Peterson said the same thing, but there is something about your art that I gravitate towards and something that I even showed my students. And I teach mathematics, but when I tell my students, Hey, you know, do you have any questions for a famous artist and somebody that takes pride in their work? And they go, oh, well, who is it? And they look you up right then and there on the spot. And they go, wow. Like literally I oh, like, all, all day they're saying, wow. And these are, you know, these are high school students, seniors. You guys. And so you're, you're to me, and I'll get in this a little bit, you're meeting demographics that, that aren't, new aren't into the art world but you're gravitating them into the art world like me now i'm extremely intrigued seeing your art and wanting to learn more about it i probably spent 12 hours yesterday oh wow uh looking up art oh, looking because oh, well and and i, I definitely <laughs> want to get into that in, in a moment here about your art i have like i said i have a lot of questions for you on sure, that sure. aspect sure. but um you, you made a comment on jordan lee peterson's show about the aspect of koreans tend to vote left or the Asian community tends to vote left, but if they want to come over here and be conservative, what do you think it is that has that switch going on to where when they're there in their home country and then they, they immigrate over here, they are making that switch in voting. Is that something that's done maybe through the media or through what well, the well, well, they, they bought into, uh, I want to tackle this at, at, at two fronts. One, because now that you're sharing with me that your students, a lot of young people watch this. Number one, um, this is going to tie into the Korean aspect of it is I used to be a liberal. I used to call myself a Democrat and to the young people like that, when I was their age, I would, I would look at, a, look at, look at these issues and feel that I was a liberal. But for me, I think I was a liberal because I just didn't know anything. I didn't have the context of understanding actual policy. I just was brainwashed and I, I was too busy looking at the faces and how people would describe them and and juxtapose such evil with this white republican or any other stuff and again they, they that creation of the split inside of me i believed it so i felt that i had to be like that and i was simply surrounded by other liberals being an artist in that sort of left-leaning field that i felt like that just was was the norm and once i came across some thomas sal uh you, you know um um, uh, even conservative painters that were producing work that I resonated with more speaking at an art level, you know, once I just looked at the romanticism behind it and then the actual economic, um, breakdown, I'm like, shit, I think I'm a conservative. Mm. And I think that's really what it boils down to. A lot of these Koreans who come to this country, the older generation, let's make it clear. Most of, they're almost all Republicans. The new young generation who was born, you know, um, born as Americans, actually Korean Americans, a lot of them are voting towards the left. And I think it's the same reason. And what I guess what I'm saying is that the reason why I've been blacklisted by a number of galleries, and a lot of people uh, attack me in many ways, is because if I sucked as a painter, if I was a shitty painter, then they would just ignore me, you know, they can kind of marginalize it. But because I won an artist of the year, you know, through the Eileen Kaminsky Family Foundation, because I've been written in White House magazine, because, you know, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I have residencies and my education and all this, like, it's almost like um, my work is so strong, too, at a gut level without knowing any anything about art, my art will hit you. Um, there's an effectiveness there because I shouldn't be towards, uh, you know, have a right wing perspective. But uh, the reason why I'm telling you all this is because I'm a person who is participating in culture because I exhibit in galleries, right? I'm a mm -hmm. classical fine artist. And 
if you look at the breakdown, everything I just said, right side of the aisle, whether it's economics, immigration, abortion, I think we win every time, 10 times out of 10, if you're going to put the logic on the table. But the left owns social media, big tech, art gallery, entertainment, Hollywood, music. Um, this is all spheres of culture. And I think most people today, you know, they're not tuning into Tucker Carlson every day at night. They're actually watching their favorite uh, singer or um, comedian or Netflix. And that oh, that's all creating uh, a cultural uh, fabric and a way to uh, interpret reality. And I think that's why so many people can look at their, I'm speaking for Korean, look at their Korean parents who are Republicans who worked hard and who got them here in the first place. And then they'll turn back and re and sort of um, get a, get an ax and destroy the boat that got them to the other side in the first place, because they're, they're uh, in the echo chamber of that sort of information. So that's exactly what happened with this stupid stop AAPI, stop Asian hate shenanigan. You know, I didn't buy it for a second. I know exactly what they were trying to do. They were trying to cripple the Asian community. Mm -hmm. But um, because I don't care about being Asian, it doesn't work on me. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and and there's, a, there's a couple of good points that, that, that I thought you made even er earlier on was you said, oh, you know, it says Korean American and that I'm just American. And that's something yeah. I'm constantly talking about on my show is the left is constantly looking at race. And it's weird because then they're calling the conservatives racist, but we don't care about what you look like. Yeah, color cons conservatives skin. are more pure. We're more pure people. And, and, and people can say things like, like, that's kind of a general statement, but I can prove it. I can prove it. Okay. You just talked about race. Here's a good example. A conservative, will, they will define racism as bringing race into the equation. You ask 20 conservatives, they'll say, if you care about race, if you bring race into the equation, you ask a liberal. I guarantee you at least two thirds, two thirds of them are going to say it's a, uh, the definition is a systemic force based on historic injustice that needs to be uh, uh, ameliorated. I guarantee you. I, I, I mean, it's, 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 I don't even need to, my proof is in, is in the pudding, right? So um, we are, we are, we are tabula rasa in a way. I like, I look at a person and say, what do they believe in? What is their past decision-making history that tells me about their patterns? And, and that's just logical and common sense. And we are rooted in common sense, but the left doesn't work that way. They, the first thing they're going to do is say, oh, shit, look at this bald guy. He thinks, uh, I, I, you know, what? He, you know, I, no, or, or they're going to say, look at Arthur with his hair privilege or whatever. It is. <laughs> it's, it's all it's all noise, man. It's all. And, and you know what it is? Um, it, there's a deeper thing that I've come to see, which is that there's a psychological reason why this is all happening. Um, it's it's of course, people can say it's economical, which it is. But it's all, everything is really just about uh, the lack of the father. Mm. Whether they're actually physically not there, it's being raised by single mothers, or the father is just a weak beta male that's allowing the child to do whatever they want. And, and, and believing that everything's relativity. And, and, and when the father is not being a, a positive authority, what, what, that, what that means is, um, <laughs> that means the kid is going to believe Good is what I can get away with rather than doing the right thing, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, and unfortunately, most people, the reason why they act morally upright is just because they feel like they're going to get caught doing something bad. And, and again, this is what I'm talking about in regards to the circumstantial nature of human beings. So, but if you can understand that if, the, if men essentially do not stand up and do what's right and understand that uh, you need to sacrifice your childish desires, um, and stop competing against women in your sexual conquest, by the way. And that's what they're doing unconsciously because they want to feel like they have control under sexuality the way a woman has that decision-making power. Um, but stop competing against women too and then just stand up naturally and do what's right. It changes the whole perspective. Um, but men got to wake up. Absolutely. And to kind of, it, it's, it, there is a similarity here, but to kind of deviate and, and somebody that's coming from two sports hmm. athletes is the idea of, transgender athletes or transgender <laughs> let me make sure i get this correctly Tra transgender we'll say men or women i'm not quite sure because we don't know anymore <laughs> but, but how does, <laughs> and I, i'm pretty sure we're on the same lines in regards to to how you're going to talk about this but what is your opinion and thinking on these 
basically men in women's sports or women in men's sports. We'll just keep it at that. Cause it gets all confusing when we talk about transgender going into each you, you know, you know, this, this I'm going to say something anecdotal, but every athlete will say the same anecdotal experience and then they'll realize like, like just ask, look, okay. When I was competing in judo briefly, I fought rank number 26, 66 kilo guy. Okay. 66 kilo. That's what it's like 150 something pounds. Okay. At that time when I was competing, I was like 190. So he's a weight class is way below me. And he's right number 26 in Cuba. Cuba's judo is phenomenal. So this is like a more intense camp kind of thing. He ragdolled me. I could do nothing to that guy. Hmm. He's lighter weight class than me, but he's not ranked number 26. And, and I'm not as serious a competitor. You know, I did that when I was in my Taekwondo days. And I'm doing judo more for like, so, just so that I have that quality of life. Right. And I love judo because the mental chest of it. Um, but I couldn't do anything to that guy. He beat me up. I would get back up. He choked me out. He throw me down and he was playing toying with me and I was bigger than him. Now check this out. That same day, that same day, this is an open sparring session called Randori. Uh, I fought rank number three woman, the heaviest woman in the weight class. Okay. When I'm fighting her, like I, I immediately realized this girl is going to kill all of these other girls, mm. but she could not do anything to me. And it has nothing to do with my skill. I'm not comparing myself in that way, but there, it's just a reality. I, my feet, foot speed is fast. My foot speed is faster. I'm much stronger. It was just, um, but that has nothing to do with my respect for her. Right. You see what I'm saying? But, but it, it just was physically speaking, we're, we're, we're grip fighting. We're in a clinch. And I was like, Oh, she's amazing. The, all these girls are dead. But in my head, I was like, you know, I was like, okay, she's ranked number three, right? And she can't do anything to me. This is a woman's uh, uh, high level. And, and she was actually heavier than the guy because she fought at like a heavier woman's weight class. So she was a thick girl. Mm -hmm. So she was closer to my weight than the guy was. Um, and, and the purpose of me saying that is that it's not fair for these girls who train so hard to get scholarships, who are working their asses off that, you know, like put it this way, I I love watching women's MMA, yep. but it, but if you put a man there, I don't want to watch that shit. So I guess my point is that like, like I think these feminists are getting equality and identicality confused, and I think that's the problem because like that's oh you can put that across every board actually yeah that is the problem, and, and in regards to sports, um, it's so self evident. And I, I know this from personal experience. Like I, I, I love watching two high-level female judokas fight. I love it, especially the, the female team in Japan. Those girls are crushing it. They're grip fighting and their angles and their techniques are amazing. And I'm learning from them. I'm learning from them and they can teach me so much. But if I fight with them versus, a, a, you know, top fighter in like Georgia and my, I mean, come on, you know, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, to me, it's so ridiculous to even make the comparison um, just from a personal experience perspective, you know, as an athlete, as I was an athlete now, I'm, you know, <laughs> a little chunky, but you, you, you and me both. You and me both. Yeah, it's and, all good. We're getting older, man. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, you, you basically said almost exactly to a T what I was talking about on my show. And I, I want to go a little step further here because the, the feminists are now pushing the idea of a, of a wage gap that we'll talk about uh, soccer, Megan Rapinoe saying, well, we're not getting paid enough money. We should be getting paid as much as the men are. And once again, they're trying to throw gender into it. Billionaires complaining. Yeah. And, and I'm going from the side of, and, and like you talked about conservatives, and this is the difference and what conservatives are doing and what they should be doing, which is on your end of getting into the culture and changing the yeah. social fabric that way. But what is your thinking on, the feminists trying to get paid as much as say LeBron James or whatever, when in reality it has nothing to do with the, the male. Yeah, I mean, aspect. look, 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 the market is going to determine everything in regards to sponsorships as well. I mean, I, I don't understand, like, um, you know, it's like, I know everyone talks about this and, it, and it's at this point, it's like, it's kind of a, it's kind of like a mantra that um, the libertarians and conservatives have been saying, but it is true. It's equality of outcome versus equality of opportunity. It really is that. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, hmm, you know, this is why I'm so into culture, man. This is why I'm so into culture because 
unfortunately, your common sense will tell you, can I talk to this person? Is he actually want to have a conversation? But most people, they're not, they don't care about data or spreadsheets or pie charts, any of that. It doesn't, it doesn't even register in their head. You have to, the narrative, who controls the narrative? The numbers don't. The numbers don't. The numbers show you the pattern and that pattern should control the narrative. Yes. If we were all logical and if we respect each other enough to hear the uh, conclusions based on the evidence. But um, people don't look at the evidence. They look at the narrative and the narrative really is about the good guys versus the bad guys, right? <laughs> Darth Vader versus <laughs> Skywalker. It, it really is that. Yes. So, um, and the left has pretty much owned that for so long. But the problem is that they actually hijacked it and, and it was hijacked through the Frankfurt school. Hmm. And, and so it really is directly associated with the Marxists, right? So a lot of people don't actually, you know, break this down quickly. The Marxists after world war one, they had all this, this idea that the proletariat will take over the bourgeoisie and they, they believed that it was social science, right? It was going to, it's a fact. This is going to happen. And it didn't happen. This idea of paradise on earth didn't happen. Hmm. Right? So, they couldn't win economically because what they predicted and what they all collectively knew what was going to happen with solidarity and confidence, they were cocky about this. This is going to happen. It didn't happen. <laughs> so they said, we can't argue no longer economically, but we're not going to, we're not going to uh, admit defeat. We're going to now substantiate the culture. So they created the Frankfurt school and it was placed in New York city and New York city, all the academics, started to come out of there, right? And uh, especially with the baby boomers. And, and now we have this, now it's gone to the point where they're, they're very effective at this. But this, I, this is why conservative artists like myself just have to speak up as well. But it's kind of crazy because the past 10 years, I feel like I've been like fighting by myself in the gallery world at least, but mm. I'm still doing so because, um, you know, it's, it's uh things will never get better until the silent majority is no longer silent. And, and I think we're silent because we're respectful and, and we want to be civil. But the problem is those people at this point today, the polarization is at the point where they don't like you regardless if you're civil or if you're not civil, either way, they don't like you actually. Yep. They might as well just be <laughs> speaking your mind. Don't be mean. Don't, don't have anger. Don't have hate in your heart because then that's stressful and it's a waste of your time. Mm -hmm. But Believe what you believe and don't feel ashamed about it because because you're not like you're not a pedophile. You're not like <laughs> you're, not, you're not doing something crazy. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yes. but it, it's just, it's insanity. But um, I'm trying to get people to just speak up. Like, that's really my, my thing nowadays. And I, I think you speak volumes again through your artwork. And I'm gonna make a transition here to the hashtag rooftop Asian huh. or excuse me, rooftop Korean. Let me get that right. And can you talk a little bit about that? hashtag and, and kind of what was influencing you on to do it and kind of where it is now yeah so um jesse lee peterson inspired me you know so he says things like uh july is white history month right or he'll say here's a great white hope yeah or or, or or he'll do uh um man he's just so good at coining things coining 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 um and guess what they work right Look at President Trump. Okay, people want to hate him as much as he wants, as they want, but his branding ability. Mm -hmm. Sleepy Joe, Lying Ted, Crooked Hillary. Guess what? They're catchy. They stick. He's playing culture. He's playing the semantic game. He understands that those are caring agents that have weight behind them. So they stick. So I was kind of kind of joking when I first started Rooftop Greens because I was kind of doing it as a counterbalance to uh, <laughs> stop Asian hate. But um, dude, one of my IG followers, I mean, I got sent this because like, I'm like, okay, they, this is, this is um, maybe this is something we should roll down. And it's because the idea of uh, the rooftop Koreans are basically like, those are like super patriots right there. There was an immigration attorney during the LA riots. He told all these Korean fathers that listen, you guys have sacrificed everything you've worked for and these riots are destroying your businesses and your livelihood. Um, there's people being assaulted. A lot of them are your children. Hmm. A lot of them, all these people are your wives, sisters, cousins, whatever. In this country, 
you can arm yourself to protect yourself. And all of these dads said, I love this country. And they all grabbed the guns, right? And there was a gun store owner. Um, and when the riots were sort of going to this area, he realized, shit, I'm so outnumbered that all of these criminal people can take all these guns and these guns will be out on the streets. It's gonna make things way worse. So he said, guys, he said, they actually announced it on this Korean sort of community radio, mm -hmm. come to the gun store. And then they all came and they had no chance at that point because uh, not only, uh, uh, there's also another context to this that's pretty badass. Um, the older, the old Koreans, that they, they even got armed because, you know, we're talking about three different generations got armed and Koreans who, again, Americans with Korean heritage. We should make that clear. Mm -hmm. But these three different generations, it's hilarious. Vietnam War vets, Korean War vets, and the mandatory military of two years <laughs> when they were in Korea. So they're all for, so even if they're outnumbered and they're outnumbered, it was, it was like a, something like, like 70 to one. Wow. So it's still crazy, but even with a little bit of a <laughs> little bit of their militia strategy, it was then no chance. And, and we don't have a lot of footage of it, but it sounds so brutal, but it was like, it was like picking, it was like smashing ants at one point because <laughs> which sounds crazy, but, <laughs> but, but the reason why uh, I'm into rooftop Koreans and, and any liberal who wants to twist this around, I'm not saying it hurt anyone. I'm not saying it hurt anyone. The caveats here, caveat time. Okay. But, 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 but my point is that like, if we should learn anything with the LA riots, it's very similar to the texture of these black lives matter riots, the George Floyd riots. What's going on with the officer Chauvin right now? You know, if he's convicted, um, you know, I, I mean, if he, definitely if he, if he's acquitted, get ready for hell. Minneapolis will burn. It's going to fall. I mean, it is going to fall. And, and uh, it, the, the ignorance uh, and the arrogance together, uh, ignorance is arrogance. That's going to be so brutal there. Um, but I guess on top of that is, um, I wanna encourage conservative men especially, and conservative women out there too, that um, um, you gotta speak up and I wouldn't risk it arm yourself. Um, because Northern Brooklyn is not too far away from my art studio here. Uh, I, I, I was able to walk through it police would run once the crowd is too big. Hmm. So I, I was right there. I'm like, okay, I'm not, we can't rely on a government agency to protect us either. It sounds so hands-on and almost surreal, but you're, you're, you're not going to even be thinking of this when there's people coming at you and there's no police to protect you. And guess what? A firearm is a great equalizer. You know, it, it, a firearm, I mean, for me, I, I'm, I'm a gun advocate more because a symbol sociologically for society of the gun too. But I also am, uh, so I do believe people have to protect themselves and it can get really bad. And uh, to the conservatives out there, it's only this bad because you guys are not speaking up. You know, because again, I, I, I wanna give you guys no choice right now. If he is, and he use this Chauvin case as an example, this trial here, if he is convicted, they will say, look at the evidence of systemic racism. This guy was a racist cop killer. If he's acquitted, they'll say America is such a racist place that they allow these cops to go out free after they kill innocent black men, whatever the narrative is. So they're gonna hit you anyways. They're gonna hit you anyways. That's a fact. So you might as well speak up and say what's right because then at least they hate you while you're standing up without those psychological constraints of feeling like a peon. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and it's better for your kids. This is the only reason why I did. I, I, I felt like I never had to speak up, Brad. You have to understand, like I was I was doing well as a painter. Right. I was just able to live my own life quietly, making art and selling it. But I spoke up because it's it's the, the cup of bullshit was just so over was just pouring out. And um, mm, but it's better for everything collectively. So I, I, I mean, it's weird, but I just want to wake people up you know but it's odd because like i even told jesse like after the show I'm like i'm not a radio host i'm not a public speaker i'm not a politician i'm a i'm a painter right but 
I was hoping for some people, um, I was actually trying to speak for conservative artists first, but now what I'm seeing is that people who are afraid, I understand, I empathize with a person has children and a wife and that and their job. I mean, I, I can get that a little bit, but I gotta say at the same time, like I work in the art industry that's basically dominated by the left and I'm speaking out so like with like pure like flamethrowers. Mm. <laughs> so just speak up. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it's, it's like because, uh, you know, we, you've done nothing wrong and all the left has, all they have actually is the unearned sense of moral superiority. And that's what they live off. And once you understand that, that linchpin is out. You know what I'm saying? That's all they have. And numbers. So, I mean, pick your fights. Don't be stupid sometimes. Like I have like, there's like 20 people and you say, yeah, or something. And that's, then you just gotta run. But, it, but if it's a moment where it's, you know, you know, you're safe, but people might, people's feelings might get hurt. They don't mind trying to hurt your feelings. Don't try to hurt their feelings, but just speak up and, you know, be like, actually both Christ and Buddha did this. Speak the truth, but speak the truth for the sake of truth. Just speak the truth. Don't try to even change your minds. Just say what's right because it's in your heart. And if they're going crazy and blah, 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 the reaction goes insane. You know, this is why he, they, he, this notion of silent prayer or Zazen, these religious teachings, is when something's going crazy in front of you, you cannot calm water by trying to flatten it with your hand. You need to let it be still and wait. and Eventually, it'll be flat. Same idea. If someone's going crazy in front of you, they're showing all their vehemence and aggression and anger and hate, just watch them like you're watching TV. <laughs> it sounds, it, it, it's, it's, this is interesting. You can learn this from the uh, religious people. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, don't have malice in it because then you have to carry that evil and the hate in your heart. But just mm-hmm. say what's right. And if people get offended by it, that's their, that's their problem, actually. You know, they're not entitled to getting inside your brain like a, some weird zombie. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's crazy. And, um- to kind of make the transition into to art a little bit, and I'm going to ask this question, then I want to roll into actually your art, because I, I have a lot of questions, predominantly because I'm interested in it. And then, But you made the comment that you're an artist, and we as conservatives need to enter into the cultural sphere. But to me personally, I was so excited for you to come on to the show, because I look at you more than just an artist. I mean, the way that you publicize or or project your your viewpoint and your ideology and what you believe to be true is to me what i call an intellectual and that to me has the 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 biggest the biggest voice even more than me because we need people like you and and, and as an artist as a painter that's somebody that is able to take their ideas and not just put it in painting for for others to see in that sphere but also the intellectual realm that can take the statistics that can take the data and make sense of it, not just through art, but also through your words. And so to me, um, we're both new to YouTube, but your voice and the way that you, you portray things t- in my mind is you're going to, you're going to have a massive impact on the young, but also multiple, multiple sphere, spheres where I'm kind of, yes, through YouTube trying to get in the cultural sphere, but I, I still speak in terms of data as a statistics teacher. So and we need that too. We need that. You, you, you know, we need every dimension. We, we need to uh, fight at every, at every dimension, actually. It's funny because um, I, I often tell people I'm, I'm, my predilections are more towards romanticism rather than, uh, um, but, but, but it's true. You need to have, as long as you understand that the intellect is a tool, it's not something that you sh- don't let the intellect use you. You have to use it because, um, you know, Nietzsche talks about this, where some people can become so intellectually uh, lost in their own reality tunnel. That's why you can you can talk to these college students that will always have an answer for anything, but it's really just circle jerk. And they're able to convince themselves anything they want because I'm using my brain and I'm able to say these words and they sound complicated and intersectionality. And, you know, what I'm saying like, so just understand that uh, uh, intellect that's not grounded in common sense. Can, can actually be, uh, uh, you know, intellect is a double-edged sword. It's a, people have to understand it. The, psycho, the uh, um, psychotherapists understand this. The intellect is a double-edged sword, mm. right? It's incredible. It, it's, it's the shit, <laughs> but, it's all, but, it, but, it, but, it, but it, it can also stab you. So just, mm. just as long as it's grounded in common sense and um, 
Yeah, you know, one thing I'm trying to have conservatives understand, and I'm doing my first public speaking event actually in uh, Howard County about this subject is that mm-hmm. conservatives have to take back the culture, but but they have to do it in a way that's not cliche because often when people hear that, when they hear Andrew Breitbart saying politics is downstream from culture, or if they hear, you know, which is what Dennis Prager also has been saying for quite some time, and uh, Michael Savage, by the way, this has been repeated. They often think that means now I got to paint a fucking American flag with a ball of eagle flying across it and, and a Statue of Liberty. And, <laughs> you know, it's, it's almost like this is why, like, like when Daily Wire did that movie Run, Hide, Fight and all that, like, I appreciate it. But it's almost like if you're making like, here's what I mean by that. We just have to understand. We have to take back to understand that romanticism is rooted towards uh, sentimentality towards traditionality that's mm. it that's it we don't have to do all this other stuff we don't have to start saying controlling what the artists want to narrate uh, as conservative uh, creatives that's not what i mean um they're being a little bit too uh uh they're treating the art like it's an economic plan because we are logical mm-hmm. um it's just simply under changing the terms and understanding that the Frankfurt School and the postmodernists and the art professors are the ones who made people think that to be a creative person or an artistic person, you're you're a liberal. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, I mean, I mean, Jordan Peterson talks about why that is valid to a point because you're more open-minded. That I totally understand that, but um, conservatives can be just as open-minded and free. But in regards to you know, government spending hmm. or, or taxation, you know, um, they can have that. It's not, it's not a contradiction to have those kind of sort of uh, perspectives um, that I don't know why, but the left will say it seems divergent, but it really isn't. It, I, I mean, there, it's your art is one thing, right? But your art is you painting on a canvas. What does that have to do with, with economic policy? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I think we have to, simply understand that um supporting conservative artists simply means well it's two things conservative artists have to speak up that's number one and i'm one of the headliners here okay you have to stop saying stop playing the social camouflage bullshit Hmm. stop being a beta male okay an alpha male is not about muscles or cars that is can be indicators but you can see a muscle bound loser that Hmm. doesn't matter Okay, it's not about the externality. It's about an alpha male is somebody who stands up for what's right. That's it. That's it. So we have to do so in our domain. So I, I've been doing so in, in the art world. And I think that the second half of it, so that's one for the actual artists. But secondly, the art patrons, the collectors, they can't be quiet either. But it's the same thing, same diagnosis. They need to stop being quiet because I know so many collectors. Most of my collectors actually are patriots, veterans. I know there's some, uh, I probably shouldn't say their name. There's famous UF MMA guys. So, so, I mean, my point is that like, um, but the, the, it's almost like they agree with me, but they, they're like, I wouldn't say that in public though. It's, a, it's the same thing, but it shows the intolerance because uh, a collector that's, a, uh, that's towards the left, it's, I wouldn't, I've seen situations where they find out that the artist they like is a conservative and they don't want their art anymore, but a conservative collector will collect everyone based on just the art they like. So they're even more tolerant, Mm -hmm. you know? So it's, it's, um, but we just got to speak up and be vocal because otherwise they think it's okay to keep encroaching and keep pushing. And, 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 And it's not, it's really not because they're there. And matter of fact, most of the richest people I've met are usually all Republicans, mm-hmm. you know, unless, unless you're in the tech world, that, that's a little bit both, <laughs> but um, it, it's, it's interesting, but I understand because again, conservatives, we don't want to be rude. We don't want right. to be rude, but we're not being rude. We're not, that's the thing that, that, that isn't rude. That's the thing. It's really not rude. It's um, they're being rude. <laughs> that's what, they're the ones being rude. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I think that's just what, what I've been seeing during all these, all this time working in this industry. And you and me both. And, and I definitely have a connection with Jordan Peterson, your artwork that 
I was looking up last night and kind of studying the different images that are that's in your artwork. But you, the connection that, that I want to make to me doing acting Screen Actors Guild to you being in the culture and the art world as well is I've lost since I've come out, which was about when Trump was elected. Yeah, uh, I've, I've, I've literally lost almost every single one of my friends in Hollywood. I'm, I was not a big actor. I just kind of small projects and stuff, but none of them will talk to me anymore. And I was actually told, I'm not going to give the agency's name, but I work with somebody that works for one of the big talent agencies. And I was talking about getting back into it. Hey, look, I got credentials. I got a, I got a decent resume and demo. And he said, you're not going to quote, you're not going to get looked at because you're a white male right now. I'm not even kidding you. So really? <laughs> And, very racist. and so I get it, but how, before we move into your, how, how has it been since you've been talking about more of your conservative ideas now as a painter? Been well, it's funny because I, I get, I, I've gotten a lot of hate, you know, I, I've lost like hundreds of Instagram followers, but I gained hundreds more. Mm. So I'm getting way more love. And th th it, it, it makes me want to say two things. I sound like a evangelizing people, <laughs> but, but it does make me want to say two things. One, which is that anybody who's afraid to come out, like, you know, conservatives are the new gay. You know what I mean? Anyone, <laughs> anyone who's afraid to come out, first of all, um, the reason why you are is because one, you don't want to lose your friends. You don't want to hurt anybody like that. I get it. And you're also afraid when that happens, you'll be alone, alienated, and you'll be jumping into this dark abyss and there's no one there to hang out. That doesn't happen. You'll get way more love, but they're going to all be quiet. I got, I got a lot of friends and a, a lot of new people in my life now, but they're like, yeah, you know, I wouldn't say it publicly to you, but I really support what you're doing. I get emails like, dude, I, I really resonate with what you're talking about. And in my head, I'm like, why don't you just speak up? So it's almost like now that I have all these people, I got hundreds of messages, like right after both showings on the uh, JLP show, for instance. I'd tell them all the same thing. I'm like, yeah, so basically just do what I did. Just speak up now, you know, because um, every man has the same power. Again, I don't have to show any of this, but I'm just speaking the truth and I'm not afraid of letting them control what I believe and dictate and, and, and relegate my, 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 uh, my beliefs to my skin tone or, or um, my, um, I don't know, gender, whatever, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> like I've gotten to that point. So, um, yeah, just, you know, it's, it's a, it's, it's, you just like, don't be afraid to tell people that you're a conservative, like, like them getting mad, you, they do not deserve, like people have, again, reliability is scarce guys. Don't just let people, um, don't just give that up to people. And you can be polite, of course, but if they're showing who they are, don't get frustrated, but just walk away. It's a waste of time. And, and the people who are going to, not want to be your friends anymore because you have a different opinion about economic problem solving, which is ridiculous, by the way. Um, they're not really your friends. They're not really your friends. It's like when my mother told me when she came to this country, she wanted to, you know, as an egalitarian, she kind of called herself a feminist and all this stuff. Um, shame on her, by the way. But, <laughs> but, 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 but uh, she told me that the moment she said, you know, I, you know, I have all these degrees. I'm, I'm a composer and all this stuff. Like she's, she's very high education and, and very high level cello player and composer and all this stuff. And she goes, you know, I think it's, I, I'm ready to, I'm ready to be a wife amongst everything. I want to have kids. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is really what it's about at the end of the day, whether you're a man or woman, she goes, all of these people who are girl power, raw, raw, they all turned on me. Because they really just support you if you fit their plantation narrative, yep. you know. So it's it's all it's all been lies, and it's all coming to the front too. Because you put anything underground and it festers, mm. right? And I think sunlight is the best disinfectant. So what we should see, guys, it's not getting worse. Don't worry, it is not getting worse. Things are getting revealed. Okay, that's the difference. Things are getting revealed, but guess what? You can look at this in a pessimistic way. Oh my God, it's getting, look at, it's being revealed. Look how polarized it is. This is terrible. The tug of war. Wh how, why can't we just get along? Or you can look at this in a positive way. Now I know exactly where they stand. Now you cannot hide anymore, right? Now I can say, no, you want this because you want to control me and you want power and wealth. Like you can, it's, it's much more clear to say that 
but you need to be willing to speak up and trust your gut and trust God and trust your friends. You really do care about your well-being. And I think um, that's really what it boils down to, man. <laughs> you know, the way that you speak and, and the way that you portray conservative thought is going to attract a lot of people. And I see the influences of other conservatives or other intellectuals like Jordan Peterson and to make the connection to your artwork on me looking at it last night and doing more research because I lack in the understanding of how to read art, to look at art. I'm just, I'm a numbers guy. And awesome. Yeah. Something I, something that intrigued me. better at it actually, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to look at this as more of a, 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 me learning from you, the artist, and you kind of teaching me a little bit about art. But something that really resonated with me through your art was not just how beautiful it was, but the idea that Jordan Peterson talks about order and chaos and mm -hmm. yin and yang and with the Tao. And hopefully I'm saying the, the, the middle part correctly. But yeah, yeah. That, that Tao is where, where that order and chaos meet. And for me, I think that your art portrays that idea of order and chaos because there's so many colors going on. But that placement of your color palette and where each color is, in my mind, and I don't know for sure, this is more of a question, has a specific placement and purpose on top of what those images are showing to meet that idea of, yes, there's a lot of disorder that may seem like it's going on, but it all is packaged as well as order. And you have that perfect fine line of order and chaos. And to me, that's what makes your art so intriguing beyond also the idea of what you're truly portraying in your thoughts and your ideas on a canvas. You should be my spokesperson. That that's well said. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's very well said because um, there's nothing random about my placement. It's completely intentional and you can create space in two ways. You can actually draw perspective, mm. right? And that can move the viewer's eye in a certain way, or you can play with contrast, right? And everything is contrast in, in regards to, uh, our senses, you know, you know, on and off in regards to volume, uh, you know, music space versus having a note. And even in regards to color theory, it's, uh, you know, I always create contrast. So I'll put a lot of blues with orange next to it. So it pops up, you know, so if you see, a, if you see a, um, a bucket and there's 30 blue balls in there and I put one orange ball, where's your eye going to go? The orange ball right so it's um but if i now put a red ball in a certain area so that now it makes the the transition to the orange in between with the yellow and i, I that's why i'm playing with basically it's kind of like a uh, a puzzle with constant moving pieces but also i'm trying to pull off the symbolic language too so i'm I, i'm often trying to do a lot at the same time because you know the artist side of me the studio side of me is i'm competing against my last painting mm -hmm. i'm just always trying to challenge myself and grow um, but you know, it's, 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 uh, yeah. And, and the symbolic part of it too, is, is what takes it to the next level too. Cause I'm, I want to be able to speak to anyone, you know, a person, a little kid sees my work and feels, Oh, I like lines. Awesome. Let's talk about that. Or, you know, a professor might come in and say, ah, you, you put the Virgin Mary next to this Chinese food dog because you're talking about the sacredness of protecting the mother and the child. Mm. Well, like they can extrapolate these ideas or go down to Joseph Campbell, whatever it is, right? But, but I will say that like, I get so many influence from so many beautiful people out there. Um, but, and I appreciate what you just said. Like, I, I hope to be more influential towards the good and share this good with my, you know, with ideally beautiful art too, you know, uh, I think that's a very unique combination that, that I offered um, our world. But um, I will say that like, I am first and foremost, I'm an artist, I'm a painter. I'm in the studio all day. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 I, and I wanna see it all proliferate, of course, but um, I, I, it, I feel like that, that also is my um, marketability in a way, because mm. I really am a, like, I'm a person who spends, you know, there's the organic fluid side and the passion side of creating work, but there's this mechanical side too. I'm a person who's literally in the studio for eight hours a day painting. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and um, I just feel 
but it's but I do I will say I do have a almost equal passion towards spreading truth because I do believe that it is um our responsibility as men mm -hmm. to care about social cohesion I really do you know um I, I've, I've often said at like a baseline level you know like let's say a woman's interested in you she's not she's not going to really approach you she's going to do things to make you come to her or she's going to be around your bubble but she's not going to say hey how's it going you know i i, I want to you know check you out whatever <laughs> whatever. whatever the hell you know um mm. so you can't suddenly expect a woman to care about a large-scale sociological issue and jump up 10 levels which is much harder to do which is speaking to at the public domain about something like that you know i mean there are the women who do that and and but those are really rare mm -hmm. right in regards to the percentage but men not only do you have to approach women when we're in our teens uh, we need to step up and eventually you should graduate to the next level of speaking up which is bringing back the order of life and um fighting for familial cohesion mm. and individual rights rather than the collective uh, that's what it boils down to and i feel like we have that intrinsically in our gut too mm. right but with public school with the left's ideological subversion they're just pushing that down more and more it's all about disarming fathers and disarming people with guns yep you know it's when, when people don't have fathers and guns anymore ooh, we no longer have the power uh you know in our own hands um i think i totally changed the topic where you asked me to by the way no and it, it <laughs> but it but it, it it's still on topic because again everything we're talking about is portrayed in your artwork and that's that's yeah, yeah that, that, that is true i i like to paint uh a lot of masculine imagery uh, because i think that uh masculinity is the most hated thing today mm. i really do think so because um like even this notion of toxic masculinity and all this stuff and you know, and the funniest thing though is that I do actually blame men for that, hmm. because uh, the men who either participate in hookup culture, they're actually unconsciously fueling these feminists who are bitter towards men because they they still haven't found a man that is willing to um, endure and almost correct them and guide them in the right light. So they're actually unconsciously fueled by that. Mm -hmm. um, but so but so in in a way it is, but. But I do think that the hatred of men, that's not acceptable. You can't be hating men like this because it's almost like if I said all, all women are, are narcissistic whores. Hmm. Like, you know, that's the same thing as saying all men are patriarchal tyrants. No, no, we can also be the wise king. That's a duality, mm -hmm. right? So it's, um, yeah, I, I'm trying to bring back positive uh, masculine light so that um, men will know how to handle women by understanding that don't compete with women though which is what this whole sex craze culture right now is that's really what it is they're competing against women it's so strange for me yes <laughs> you, you you and me both <laughs> and i think, yeah, I think yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot of conservatives and i'm looking at i'm looking at a lot of your, your your paintings here and and i'd like to post some up on the screen as as we go yeah. but i've noticed there's a lot of connections and correct me if always correct me if I'm wrong, please. I don't want to misrepresent what you're painting, but sure. there seems to be a connection between Christianity and Buddhism in a lot of your paintings. Yeah. And <laughs> there's, there's, and I'm a Christian and there's a lot of connections to be made, but what, what, what are you trying to show through that idea of Christianity and Buddhism within? So I'm, I'm a non-denominational Christian. Okay. Let me first me I am a Christian, but uh, I've always been so interested in Buddhism. And people can say, oh, it's because you're Asian. Well, maybe, but the person who actually got me really interested in Buddhism is, is, a, is a white guy. Mm. So I don't, I don't know about that. Uh, <laughs> gentleman by the name of Alan Watts. And Alan Watts was uh, like, like my man crush philosopher when I was a kid. Mm. And um, it's just, well, his ability, is, he has the gift of the gab also. His level of articulation is incredible. But he's one of my greatest sources of my art, mm. inspiration-wise, the context that he spoke from. Mm. And... Um, I think the Buddhists get a lot of things correct, but okay, a couple of things though. So, so getting, getting into comparative religion a little bit and how that pertains to uh, the, the greater society and politically as well. This idea of uh, mm, Buddhism is like packageable Hinduism. It's like cooler. It's like a cool Hinduism. 
because because all the ideas are uh, um, more easily translatable. They don't. There doesn't have to be a um, hundred million variations of gods and all this mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, it's it's more uh, reduced and it's more um, uh, translatable in that way. But you know, many people they think that Jesus was the individual who experienced cosmic consciousness, so he understood his connection to the Father. And what happened is um, he lived in a tyrannical government called Rome during that time. And the lang religious language they had, he had to say, um, I'm, I'm, I'm the son of God, rather than saying I woke up or, hmm. or I, I, you know, it's, it, the language structure was different. But I feel like if Jesus said, oh my God, I'm God, you know, to like, uh, to like, Hindu saddle monks, they'll say, Yeah, yeah, congrats, mm. you woke up. Yeah, so, so it, it was something that, um, spiritually for me, I, I think that, uh, um, Buddha and Christ, what they both have in common is they're like different forms of alpha males, essentially. The, the, the spiritual figure that, um, men want to be like, essentially, mm. but, um, and they have that in common because I think they both had that cosmic consciousness experience. And I've had something of that sort with psychedelics. And um, I had my face with uh, a lot of uh, entheogens. But um, I, I think that that's sort of the reason why I find them both so attractive. But I will say Christ has, Christ is, um, what they both have in common is this notion that real men should be religious and sort of be spiritual that's what they have in common because otherwise you know carl jung's notion that uh the fear of god is the beginning to wisdom mm. idea that you need to have something you believe you are under actually if you don't fe believe that there's an authority that you should be under then what are you going to do you're going to live in relativity yep. right or you're going to uh want bigger government Right. That's why all the atheists are all leftists, essentially. That's how they vote statistically. Um, so, so, so my, my perspective is that mm, I believe Buddhism and Christianity are the two modern religions that really have a chance mm. you know, to really awake people up towards being better people. But I, I do put more eggs in Christianity because the Christians, not only do they want to have that sort of peace, they also will stand up for what's right and, and be, uh, have no, like they're willing to fight for what's right too, though, because a Buddhist will basically say, this isn't right. You should like, we shouldn't be doing this. Like let's, let's, okay. Let's say a Buddhist will tell a black lives matter protester that's vandalizing. That's wrong. That's what they'll say to themselves. And they believe that and they're right to think that, but then they'll watch it happen and say, shame on that person, hmm. whatever. Right. Something like that or get dissociated. A Christian will say the same thing, but then they might say, stop that. What are you doing? Knock it off. The Christian has a little bit more um, fearless action, I've noticed. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's the one thing. That there's there's, a, there's um, some bravery. that It's almost like I mean, I, I'm, I'm playing serious bro psychology, like religious person. But this is just my interpolation. A Christian is like, 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 like a more bold and um, um, macho or Buddhist in a way for me. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going with this, but I don't know. I put myself in the shoes of these figures I paint actually. And I mm. just imagine what that sort of reality would be. And then I sort of feel that sort of uh, the different direction that my, my brain would go. And I mm. feel like Christ was just way like, Christ had to go against Rome. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The, the Buddha, he, he, he was already rich. He let go of all that. And I think that's true in regards to the material world that conservatives, uh, they put values and spirit higher than even materiality, which mm. is why they actually get better at their materiality too, because it's in the right uh, hierarchical structure. And liberals, they just want materiality, control, and power. I do agree with that because we have religion. So, it, um, but, but I think that uh, in, in my experience, I believe that Christianity and Buddhism have so many similarities and in the Joseph Campbell way that when these two cultures did not communicate with each other, but they produce very similar narratives and similar substructures, it implies uh, an archetypal truth that is in human nature to narrate mm. 
regardless of the externalities. So for me, there was something really interesting. But um, so they're very similar, but um, Christ is definitely much more of a more of a gangster in that realm. <laughs> and you know. I just find it fascinating because I'm looking at the uh, the artwork of Rebirth and the connection. Yeah, it's the color scheme. One is beautiful. Two, I love. Okay. I believe to be white doves. Yep. And then the idea of rebirth, like for me, when I see white doves like that to make the connection to Christianity, I'm thinking, okay, the lightning, light, the lighting on Jesus, right? The connection between God and Jesus happening, um, and then having, and for, forgive me, I'm not too eloquent or knowledgeable on Buddhism, but the, I'm assuming a Buddhist figure s- sitting right in the middle. Yeah, that's a, that's a Gandhara Buddha. Um, yeah. Is, but, is, but, is yeah, so that was that, that was uh it's funny because you know i just started this vlog i think that's going to be like the next episode that um my assistant here is going to produce uh and, and it's production because i actually started that um like I, I was sketching ideas before and i have stacks of sketchbooks they're like really high it goes up really high now because i have so many so i sketched out what i wanted to do and I, and usually i go into it with control right but uh, I had a birthday party here. Um, this is in January, though. And then I got pretty inebriated. So I just said, hey, guys, I'm going to draw for you all straight up right here, right now. So I just, I just did it kind of live and all that. So, But that's how it was produced, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's a beautiful one. No, no, I mean, it didn't get to that point. I, it was almost the initial stage of what I did. And then I had to go back into it. Because my painting style is so many layers and layers and layers and layers and layers and layers that... Um, but uh, yeah, I'm going to make a vlog about that episode, probably. I would love to know when that's out so that I can inform okay, everybody sure, else. Sure, sure. Yeah, else yeah. To... Because this is... This my vlog me... is weird, by the way, because it's all over the place. It's not just my art. It's like, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> the, the one... Well, I could say that when I saw the... What actually got me to look you up was somebody wrote on my channel, check out Arthur Kwan Lee, got connected. Oh, cool. And then when I saw the Rooftop Asian video... I, I personally, there was a story there. There was obviously f- the way that it was created for me was, was top notch. And then obviously the way, and as I keep mentioning the way that you, you speak and connect ideas together, I, I thought it was great. So I'm looking forward to really anything that oh, you post you, to brother. be honest with you. Oh, thank you, brother. I appreciate it. Yeah. And those of you tuning in, um, my Instagram is Arthur Quinley and my, my YouTube is also Arthur Quinley. My YouTube game is really new. I mean, I think, I, I mean, um, but my, 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 it's funny because my Instagram will have like, you know, 8,000. I mean, that's not that big, but it's a, it's a good following. But then, but then my, um, my, my YouTube is like, is like, you know, fraction, but it's all good. We're going to get there. We're going to both get there, brother. Amen to that. Amen to yeah. that. There's another piece here. Um, it seems like there's a connection to Roman culture. And I, I think hopefully I'm getting that right to, make connections with other cultures as well. Can you kind of expand a little bit on that idea of influence from Rome or? Yeah. So, so, so I, I have an impulse to produce and select my figures based on two, um, two attractions, I guess. Yeah. And, and one side is obviously just the aesthetic. Sometimes things are just so well done and, and, and a, a sculpture I might see at the Met is just so beautifully produced. I might want to, Render something similar, or actually, just I'm drawing that figure right there. I'll take the sketchbook, something of that sort. So that, that's one angle. It's, it's an aesthetic uh, dive into it. But then the other side is, I like to show multiple different cultures onto one canvas, um, and it's very uh, American thing I'm doing with that, right? But what I'm really known for, Brad, is like, I mean, what I'm known for is resurfacing traditionality and and sort of, um, and often in a masculine form onto the canvas that's kind of what i'm known for Mm. because uh i think we live in such a you know a a time where decadence is normalized and traditionality is thrown out the window and it's just looked upon as outdated and and uh purely ephemeral you know Mm -hmm. so in many ways what i'm doing is i'm trying to plant these seeds of our our pedagogical past Mm. and so that we can still be grounded in those, uh, in that collective wisdom, you know, imagistic wise, because I'm doing this with symbols and, and imagery. But uh, it, this is this is what I'm diving into, Brad. So when I'm putting all these different cultures, it's 
it's often any kind of symbolic reference that that really spoke to me i put onto the canvas now i will tell you just to make it clear often i often i it's like i might read something about this one samurai mm -hmm. i'd be like wow this is amazing i'll like stop reading right there because I, I already feel like i want to paint it i need to go while it feels hot so i just go paint it so there's a lot of that going on so like i've had professors and critics come to my studio and they've understood the imagery way further than I have almost every time. But I was, uh, as an artist, because again, I'm, I'm, I have a more romantic impulse, actually. I was just captivated by saying, I have to render this figure. Mm. This will look beautiful next to this. I just read about this figure here. This stacks very well with this one. So now I'm going to play them together. You know, so there's a lot of um, uh, spontaneity going on, too. But um, yeah, I, I think that's the beauty of it. I'm sort of creating in this, in this, in this sweet spot of order and chaos. You know, like you said, it's really interesting. Yeah, and like I said, it it it's gorgeous work. And as you're speaking, I'm I'm literally scrolling through your your Instagram, and there was a piece that I'm I was looking at it last night, and it was very patriot. It was a very patriotic piece. This is a a large, very large work. It's almost like mural size, and that was simply my experiences with 2020. Um, it has so many different juxtaposed imagery. It has a like uh, implication for the Chinese flag in the top corner. I'm looking at it right now, actually. It has like the Capitol Hill on the side. Mm -hmm. It has all of these uh, law enforcement figures. It has the samurai um, Hagashige, who, who I'm a fan of. It has all of this, you know, dystopian tension and, and drama. Cause, and I wanted that painting to really feel heavy and weighted. I didn't want that painting to be like a lot of my paintings are colorful and bright and happy. And it's almost like uh, vivid, right? And mm -hmm. vibrant. But I wanted that painting to be really dense and weight. Like I okay. didn't want it to necessarily to feel beautiful and, and uplifting. But I, I wanted I wanted to sort of that was my interpolations of what happened in 2020, you know, and, and all the uh, uh, drama associated with it. And that that was exactly my question was. And you, you answered it to T was I noticed I one I loved it so much and I wanted to ask about it, which is why I was getting frustrated. I couldn't find it there. I was like, where is this thing? Cause I wanted to note, make a note huh. about it because the color sure. palette was so different than what I've seen in your other artwork. And to me, when, when there is a, a change like that, there has to be a reason for it. And when you're making that connection to, I believe you said 2020, it's so much more impactful too. When, when people, I've never been to an art gallery. This is what's going to, talking to you is going to push me literally to go buy a ticket to an art gallery extremely soon when you Here's go to art thing, though oh sorry no no go, go ahead go ahead <laughs> no just just before you do that because i don't want you to waste your money is um hmm, a lot of art today sucks <laughs> okay a lot of art today sucks and that is entirely because of the left is there a way for to find which no, would be a, a, lot, a lot of art a lot of art is great but uh, make sure you really research the place. Like I would definitely go to like, um, like go to museums, always go to museums. Um, although you're going to still see a lot of crap in like a more modern art section, but there is a movement that I hope that will really stick this idea of like a, like a new romanticism or something like that, because, mm -hmm. Hmm. Like it's almost like we've been doing the relativity thing so much or, or anything is anything. Men can be women, you know? uh kids are you know, it's, you, know, all, you know you know what i'm saying you know what i was gonna get at like mm -hmm. it's like everything it's all social de deconstructionism everything can be interchangeable so that it can fit my narrative and we've been doing that for so long that i'm hoping we can kind of go back to more of a traditional sentiment um and, and with an egalitarian spirit right but but what, towards you know something more passed down so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm hoping we can go down that a little bit again but i would say uh those interested in art need to support those types of um, artists as well, you know? So, because that, that's going to be, then they'll get more attention and that'll placate the narrative. Mm -hmm. So as you go forward, just research first. And um, you can never go wrong with looking at historical art. Like, uh, like if you're in New York, go to the Met. Of course, go to the Met. My God, the Met is well worth your money. It's worth a trip to go there. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, where you can see actual Greek statues, the impressionist painters, like the masters, the masters that people look at as, yeah, but that was a long time ago. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, 
you, you won't waste your money there. You'll enjoy it. It'll be entertaining to do that, you know? Um, but modern galleries today, just, just be uh, picky with those because a lot of that is waste your time. But at the end of the day, you know, um, it's, it's, there's a lot of good artists, but there's just a lot of bad artists promoted due to, uh, you know, art education and, you know, liberal ideology. So what do you, you do? The one thing I like is you talk about supporting artists. Where can people find your art? Where could people go and support you? Oh, yeah. You can go to my website, arthurquilney.com. Uh, if you would like a work, um, you fill out the form. My assistant will see it. Just you can. We're so direct and transparent. Just give us a price point. We'll tell you what what we have at that range. All my work is fully appraised. I have people doing that for me. Um, follow me on Instagram on Arthur Conley, and my new YouTube thing. <laughs> my fellow YouTube uh, 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 new kid on the block here, Brad, is uh, Arthur Conley as well. And I think I only have uh, two videos out now, but I think I'll be putting one out tomorrow but it's very different it's not even art related in many ways but it's something that was uh, sentimental for me so but yeah that's where you can find me as of now i don't do any of the twitter and all that i probably should but yeah you can find your man and all and um youtube ig and google or or my website arthur colney arthur colney arthur colney arthur colney <laughs> <laughs> i'll make no. sure i put in all of those links that you give and in the description so please make sure you go support arthur Quanley. arthur thank you thank so you. much for joining the bald brad show i greatly appreciate it thank you so much brad i appreciate you man let's uh let's let's keep on going brother <laughs> amen to that thank you again absolutely